So, you know, as you were having this experience with her, you talked about your need or the way that you tend to process these types of experiences was through writing. And you could say it's through research as well, but to write this thing out. And you had already, of course, done so much work on identity and our sense of self, what our identity is as a self and how that fits into our memory. Right. And so what I'm curious is like when this was happening, when you were witnessing your mother go through this, I'm sure you had maybe ideas about what it would look like for her to go through this experience of losing her identity, so to speak, because she was losing her memory. So what in your experience in doing this, I mean, and having this experience with her, what maybe validated your work and what maybe stood up against it and showed you that maybe identity isn't what you thought it was? Yeah. I'll, I'll give you an example of each of those. Um, okay. There had been, and still is, um, a debate in both kind of the philosophy and psychology of, of life narratives. Um, and the debate, which I'm going to simplify for you, uh, breaks down into one group of people who subscribe to the idea that that narrative is is part and parcel of of adult human life, right? That that it's it's kind of woven woven into the fabric of experience, sometimes in small ways, sometimes in large ways. I would largely be in that camp. And then there were others who had become convinced that the idea was being overused. And at an extreme, there would be some who essentially said, life doesn't have narrative built into it. Life just goes on from one thing to another. And occasionally we pause and impose narrative structure and meaning onto our ostensibly formless life in order to create some measure of order and coherence in our worlds. And so there's the narrative as intrinsic to life group and the narrative as a kind of artifice and extrinsic imposition on what is ultimately considered somewhat formless. Um, and so at one point, my mother went through a phase, um, and this was after the dementia's tragic promise phase. My mother went through a phase, as you know, of, of having no sense of who she was, having really no sense of her own history, no explicit sense of her life story or mine, or the relationship between them. And that left her in a state of chaos at times. Okay. So the chapter that I described that state of chaos is the chapter called dislocation. Uh -huh. And so in some of the work I did at the time, I essentially said to uh, the people who saw themselves as, you know, in a sense, detractors of narrative, I said, you want to know what life is like without narrative? Here's what it's like. Okay? It's chaos if you don't have that anchorage. And if you don't have some sense of your own locatedness in a meaningful world. If you're conscious of this, right? So in some of the work I did along the way, I did feel like I received something of a confirmation of the idea that, that narrative is built into the fabric of life because it's when that fabric started unraveling that my mother was probably at her most existentially dislocated. Um, 
But here's a way in which some of the ways I had been thinking was somewhat disconfirmed, or at least reshaped. In much of the work on identity, um, including some really classic work, and, and also on some level, some of my own work and, and the work of people I know and respect, it, it had been assumed that, that selfhood and memory are really of a piece, are really of a piece. And so, you know, intrinsic to the very idea of selfhood, is 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 having a memory and having a past to reflect on and so there's a lot of literature on what's come to be known as narrative identity and you know narrative identity essentially has to do with um the ways in which we construct and reconstruct our sense of self in and through our relationship to the stories we tell about ourselves and to ourselves. And, and a part of that is certainly valid and true, I think. But even after my mother had virtually no explicit short-term or long-term memory, I don't know whether to go so far as to say that she still remained herself um, because there was a part of her that had become substantially different. Mm -hmm. but, but even in the absence of memory, there was a lot that remained. <laughs> there was a remained in terms of her way of relating to the world, in terms of her wit, in terms of her love, in terms of her occasional aggressiveness, and so on. So even though she could no longer, quote, tell a story of her life at that point, even though she really had minimal autobiographical memory, as it's called, there was still a lot of stuff operative in her. Um, at the level of character, at the level of comportment, at the level of kind of being in the world, that remained, that remained. Um, and so that forced me to ask myself whether this association between memory and selfhood might need to be revised in some way so as to be able to accommodate maybe those forms of selfhood that remain even in the wake of memory's demise. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, again, it's not as if all memories were gone. I mean, I said before, she still had an amazing memory for music and the lyrics of song, trivia. She had a good vocabulary. But... You know, in the later years, she really didn't remember most people. And, and it's not even clear towards the very end that she remembered me. Uh, she lost memory of my father along the way. She lost memory of the man she spent some 15 years with after my dad's death and, and so on. So, um, so eventually that dislocation that I described to you, where am I? You know, if you hadn't showed up when you did, she said at one point, I would have screamed, right? What's going on? As things got worse, which is to say as the, the deterioration of her brain and on some level mind continued, she moved beyond that phase. She moved beyond that phase. Um, and that's because there was no longer the same kind of self that there had been. There was not a, a self self-conscious of its own existence, so to speak. Yeah. And so by the time my mother moved into the nursing home, she was beyond panic. 
She was beyond dislocation. She was beyond lamentation. Because she didn't have the kind of mindset at that point which would have even allowed for those kinds of sentiments and emotions. Mm -hmm. Now, seen from one angle, that's tragic. Mm -hmm. But experientially, for her, it really wasn't. Because she had, in fact, been released from some of the confusion and unsettledness and perseveration and outright puzzlement. I mean, I don't know how many times I had to tell her. Actually, let me correct that. I don't know how many times I told her, thinking I had to tell her. Um, You've been here a long time, Mom. She went through a perseveration stage when any answer I could provide was insufficient. Partly because she would forget. So, how long have I been here? It's, it's, it's been five years now. Goes into a tizzy, mm-hmm. a diverter, move somewhere else. But then she could return to it five minutes later. She might say something like, I just got here today. What do you think of my new place? And sometimes I would roll with her and say, you know, nice place. Um, And and other times I didn't. And, and you know, that's an issue we could talk about also. What do you hold? What do you keep at bay? And what what do you tell the truth about? But but sometimes I would just say as gently as I could, um, it's been a number of years Um, so she, she got hooked into the perseveration mode at one point so intensely, um, that, um, it wasn't too long after that, that she had to go to a a geriatric psych ward for about 10 days, which I don't recall exactly how I described it in the book, but it was the images of bedlam that we have from either from movies or from delirium, that's what it was like, (laughs) you know, Mm. and you know, the main, the main reason she was there is that they had to, they had to concoct some way of some new cocktail, basically, just to help her live in the world without undue suffering and confusion. So that was a hard part too. You know, sometimes she was doped up too much. Um, you know, because she could be so anxious and so irritable and so intense that that doctors saw the need to kind of tamp her down. But but we tried to minimize that as much as as we could, uh, and and tried to work with her in her nearly natural state as much as possible, but that was challenging. 